That's Barry Brooks joining us live from Glendale, Arizona, the son and fun of Glendale, Arizona. And there is the man that we promised we would bring you, Mike Sealski of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mike, uh, look. They got the fake cactus behind you. Is that is that for, for ambiance? Is that it? <laughs> I'm down in the Gunner. I'm down in the lobby of my hotel in downtown Phoenix. Yeah. Um, so I picked the spot that would have the phoniest ambiance possible <laughs> in the lobby, and, and we uh, appreciate it. Yeah, this is what I came up with. Um, you know, it, it, you I could find I, a bigger cactus. I mean, seriously, I, I could have set up in front of a Taco Bell or something, but I decided no, no, not man. to. No, don't do that, man. We appreciate that. That's that's the kind of second level effort that you, you don't get anywhere else. <laughs> this uh, is true. I walked by there this morning. I, I walked yeah. by that same place this morning, man. So I yeah. was just there, bro. So oh my I, God. I, I, I came up to upstairs to do the show. Nice, <laughs> um, Mike. I I loved the piece on Jeff Stoutland. Uh, yeah. I, you went back nice. to Staten Island where he grew up. You talked to his, you know, his old neighbors, his, you know, the high school coach, the, the, the whole nine, you painted a great picture. Just, you, uh, there were a lot of things I didn't know in there. Like he had the heart procedure. He was a worried mm. guy. He was, you know, they were kind of anxiety ridden. And then he decided after he had a procedure on his, like, you know what, I'm going to, whatever, wherever ends up happening here, it's not going to be just being worried constantly, but give me a little insight on what you learned from, from Stoutland. Yeah, you know, he's a fascinating figure to me, Rob, um, because he's generally regarded, right, as the best offensive line coach in the NFL, and yet I felt like we didn't know a whole lot about him beyond, like, the New York accent that he has, <laughs> you know, and Stoutland University and the fact that he's become, like, a cult figure to, Eagle, to the Eagles and their fans. So, like, one quick example, okay? He grew up on Staten Island. He goes to college at Southern Connecticut State mm -hmm. University. And he was so into football that he and his roommate and teammate would sit in a freshman year anatomy class and diagram plays together using M&Ms. The regular M&Ms were all the skill position players, the quarterbacks, the running backs, wide receivers, and the bigger peanut M&Ms were the linemen. And they would move them all around the, the table, the desktop, and if, you know, a skill position m m got hit and got crunched, that was their way of saying, like, a guy missed the block or something like that. So this was when he was a freshman in college. And then he just kind of, you know, he looks at coaching as his calling. Uh, he bounced around, went from program to program in college football. And finally, when the Eagles reached out to him in 2012 uh, and early 2013, uh, Nick Saban kind of gave Stalin his blessing to go take the job, uh, and he's been with the Eagles ever since. But real quick, Mike, the first time Howie approaches him, it, oh, wasn't, yeah. a, it wasn't a friendly greeting that Stoutland gave him on the field before an <laughs> Alabama-LSU game, correct? No, no, Howie told this story the other night that, um, you know, it was toward the end of the 2012 season. The Eagles yeah. weren't doing well. They knew Howard Mudd was going to retire as the offensive line coach. And Andy Reid suggested to Howie, hey, go ask, go look into Jeff Stoutland because he was that much of a legend in college football. So Howie flies down there and wants to get on the field before Alabama LSU at Tiger Stadium to talk to Stoutland. And, and Stout, of course, is like locked in and focused on the game. And Howie goes there down on the field and says to him, hey, Stout, we got to get you into the NFL. And Stout looks at him and says, get the F out of here, basically. <laughs> You know, I got a game to coach. Um, but as I said, they kind of kept after him. And when they, the Eagles fired Andy and hired Chip Kelly, Howie asked Chip, hey, who do you thinking for the offensive line? And Chip said, well, have you ever heard of Jeff Stoutland? Mm. And Howie said it was, you know, it was perfect. It was like perfection. So in a way, I think he was kind of meant to be an Eagles coach. Mike, how, how long did it take you to compile a story? Because it was so in-depth. Uh, when did you start this story and how long did it take you to finish it? Uh, I started it last week, Gunner. Um, I went up to Staten Island a week ago today, actually, on mm -hmm. Thursday. Drove up to Port Richmond High School, uh, right on the island. From where I live, it's only like an hour and a half. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny, Gunner. I, I say this all the time as a joke, but I think it's true. Like, I feel like people in Philadelphia think that the New York City area is on the dark side of the moon or something. Like, it's so <laughs> far away. And it's 90 minutes, you know. Yeah, it's really yeah. not that far. And I was kind of stunned that nobody had ever done this before, like drive up there to see his old neighborhood. And his house is still there, this tiny little house right next to a park. And that's where he played touch football and tackle football. Um, and then it was just a matter of kind of making phone calls. Um, I got Kevin Gilbride on the phone, who was Stout's college coach, familiar name in NFL circles, mm -hmm. everybody knows who he is. Um, and then just one call led to another, led to another. And everybody had these great anecdotes about him. Mm. 
You know, uh, and, and how he dealt with Jason Peters, you know, they had made the trade before, um, you know, Stalin was there. But I see how he took so many of the coaching tips that Jason Peters gave him and developed them into his game. And I think that's really what's the turning point of, of really him being one of the greatest coach ever. His ability to get those tackles, to set like Jason, believe in what Jason was doing, and him to still keep that same mindset for those guys going forward. You know, I think Jason Peters kind of really um, almost was this affirmation as far as being one of the best coaches because he believed in what Jason Peters had taught him. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that, too, in that, Barrett. And I think the other thing, too, and Stout talked about this, was the way that he approaches coaching these linemen. The first thing he does is that he talks to them about what the defense is trying to do to them. So that as long as they understand that, if they understand where a guy's lining up, how he's going to try to attack them, where they can use angles and leverage, uh, then they can better understand what they need to do from a technique standpoint and why they need to do it. And then everything kind of, you know, flows from there. Mm. So, Mike, uh, a couple other odds and ends I wanted to hit you with with some of the other stuff that you've uh, you've written. Again, a phenomenal job on the uh, on the Stoutland stuff. Thanks. But uh, James Bradbury is another one to me. It, it's kind of interesting because, you know, there were a lot of questions whether he was on the downside or it was just a bad situation in New York. Clearly, he can still play, um, but they're paying Slay a lot. They may have to deal with C.J. Gardner Johnson. You know, to go with everything else, you, you know, free agent wise, um, you have any kind of idea what what kind of priority he's going to be, or do you do you kind of just chalk this up to, man, what what a, what a great rental for a year? Uh, how, how do you think the organization's looking at it? I would be surprised if Bradbury came back, Rob, and that's not a slight on him I at agree. all. Yeah. You know that that is not uh, you know uh, a judgment on how he's been because he's been terrific. You could argue that he's been more consistent and overall better than Darius Slay has been this season. As good as Slay was early on, yep. Bradbury's been more consistent. Um, but the fact is he's going to make a ton of money in the offseason. He's 29 years old. Uh, he's had a great year. Uh, he, he has the kind of the wind at his back in terms of, you know, the Giants had cut him for cap reasons, and he signs with the Eagles for $7.5 That's actually less than the cap hit the Giants are taking, uh, you know, took this year by cutting him. And, you know, they're not going to – they've kind of mastered – they being the Eagles have kind of mastered this ability, how he's mastered this ability to kind of let a guy walk and not overpay for him and then find somebody else, you know, during an off season or late in the game uh, to bring in. So I, I just look at this and say, you know, they're grateful that they got Bradbury. They're, they're particularly grateful that he had such a terrific season. But I don't think Howie's going to look at him and say, you know what, we got to overpay to keep him. They'll say, he'll say – Hey, you know, James, thank you. Good luck. And we'll go try to find somebody else. We all assume that uh, Jalen is going to get his money this off season. And with that said, when you look at the multitude of players on defense that could walk free, how severely do you think it's going to put a dent in how he, now as great as how he is, it's it, 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 working at the cap. How much do, of a significant dent do you think that's going to put in his ability to keep the bulk of these guys? Yeah, it's hard to say right now, Gunner. I think, you know, I'd be surprised if Fletcher Cox came back, for instance. You know, there's $14 million that comes off the books. Yep. Um, you know, we don't know yet what Jason Kelsey's going to do. Uh, I would be surprised if he retired, but who knows? You know, he's, he's clearly thought about it the last two, three years. Um, you know, I, knowing Howie, like we all do, I, yep. I'm sure there's like a sliding scale of, okay, if once we know about these guys – and whether they're coming back and whether we can bring them back and do we want to bring them back, that will affect how much uh, they're willing to offer Jalen, you know, the lengths that they're willing to go to in terms of negotiating with Jalen and things like that. I don't think it's just the one thing, uh -huh. um, you know, and I don't think it's a matter of like saying goodbye to a bunch of players simply for the sake of signing Jalen right. Hurts to the contract he's going to get. It's kind of a, you know, the whole thing is fluid in a lot of different ways. Mm. So, Mike, your your sense of the game. We talked earlier. I'm sorry, Barry. Do you, you want to hit something? I didn't know if you were muted or not. Go ahead. Yeah, I was muted. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, you know, I, with the whole Jalen situation and how we're we're going forward, with that Jalen is by no uh, is no doubt the franchise quarterback for for this Eagle team. And I think the going rate right now is probably you know 45 million. You know, 
Do you think there will be any of a hometown discount that Jalen would give this this um, Eagles team to keep you know some of those guys around to try to make a run for it? Will he be the Brady S type of guy in his first contract, or is it going to be later on that he's going to do that? I don't know that he'll do it at all, Barrett. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I think I think that's a rare thing uh, to to have a player who hits the market who does it in the way Jalen has done it, being a second-round pick and making the, the, the leap that he made in his third season, um, and the way that Jalen thinks of himself. You know, a guy who, who likes to compare himself and likes to be compared to Michael Jordan does not strike me as the kind of guy who's going to give <laughs> the team a hometown discount. Maybe I'm wrong right. about that, and I don't hold that against Jalen, no. but it doesn't strike right. me that he's, he'd be inclined to do that for the Eagles. Yeah, I think you got one guy who you're looking at a real serious hometown discount. It's probably Brandon Graham. I, I don't know that there's going to be anybody else. Mike yeah. and I, again, in that sport, get every penny you can get, man, for, for the way you yeah. Fletch your body. Yeah. I think Fletch will. I think Fletch will. I do. I think Fletch will. Uh, that would have to be an awful big discount. I mean, you He's know, coming 14 off of $14 million. million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, $14 right, million right. Dollars this year. You're chopping that a third, maybe? Probably. Yeah. And, he and, might get seven. He might get seven. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, but they have so much depth along the defensive line. Yes, you know, with and and with so many draft picks coming up, you know, and who knows who they've targeted, who may become available, or they think is going to become available. Um, you know, th this team's going to look different next year, guys. It absolutely is. Yeah, no question. Well, I mean, let's 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 get to the game then. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, guys. I want to push towards the game. Yeah. What do you think Gannon's chances are of shutting down Patrick Mahomes? Honestly. Yeah, you know that's a great question, Barrett. Um, Look, the the way that you do it is that the way is the way the Eagles can do it and have done it to other quarterbacks this season, which is pressure. And particularly pressure with the front four and or with one blitzer, uh, or with Hassan Reddick just being relentless. Um, that's the way you you shut this down. And you know, you've got to be creative in terms of covering Travis Kelsey. I think you'll see Bradbury on him. I think you'll see C.J. Gardner-Johnson, Avante Maddox, maybe a linebacker once in a while. you got to throw different looks at them. Uh, we know Andy Reid is going to be prepared at the start of this game. Uh, and the question becomes, how does Gannon adjust? How does Sirianni and Shane Steichen adjust in their play calling uh, to whatever the Chiefs are doing defensively? And, you know, it's funny, guys. As accomplished a coach as Andy Reid is, as great as he is, and he's a top 10, I think, all-time coach. Don't you kind of feel like the Eagles, that their coaches have the advantage when it comes to in-game adjustments and kind of decisions that need to be made quickly to win this game? If it comes oh, down to that, absolutely. don't you yeah. feel better about Sirianni yeah. and Gannon than you do Andy? Pre-game Andy, yes. in-game Eagles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I, I, that's kind yes. of how I look at it. The, yeah, only, and, the, and, only and, thing, the only thing I would say, Mike, is you have one coach – who has a plethora of experience at games at this level, you have another coach who does it. That's the only thing. But in terms of the chess pieces being able to move them at any given moment, the Eagles have a decided advantage in that regard. Yeah, and, you know, I, it was just occurred to me, Gunner. like, think, too, I think one of the interesting um, potential storylines in the game is what happens if the Chiefs take an early lead. Yeah. What happens if it's like 14 to three or 21 to 10, something yeah. like that. And here's why I think that's interesting. On the one hand, you have a young coaching staff who would be in a position in Sirianni and Steichen and Gannon that they haven't really been in, but maybe once all year, right? The Jaguars took a 14, nothing lead on them in week three or four. And, and that's been it on the flip side in Andy Reed, you have a coach who has lost some playoff games where he's had some big leads, yeah. including the AFC championship game just last season. So um, th that's going to be interesting to me. If, if the Chiefs get out to an early lead, what happens then? Can they, can they hold on to it? Can they maintain that distance? Or do the Eagles find a way to kind of come charging back and not panic? Mm. Yeah, well said, Mike. Well said. Um, historically, if they win this thing, 17 wins. A lot Best, of Eagles team, Best Eagles team of all time if they win. There you go. That's where I was going. That's with. it. Yeah, that's it. They're the, they might be the best team already, like in terms of the talent and the way that they – if you take the totality of the of the whole season, right, like the best New England Patriots team of all time is the one that went 18-1 and won and lost in the Super Bowl, right? Like they didn't win, but they're better than any other team that won Absolutely. during Absolutely. that period. 
And I think the same, sort of prin- yeah. Yeah, the same sort of principle would apply here. Um, if the Eagles win, there's no doubt. It's, it's the best Eagles team of all time. Mike, I got, I got some insight for you. If that happens, you should do a story with the Seth Joyner team because they talk about how that was the best nucleus of players ever. They didn't win it anything but they felt that roster and then you should talk to ike reese ike reese beats his chest about the 2004 team was the best team ever that'd be a great story to do i'll tell you this gunner the 04 team has an argument none of those teams that seth was on have that argument you can't win one playoff game in five years and argue that you're somehow the the best team in franchise history give me a break Well, I was about to say my 1995 team, we beat up on the Detroit Lions, but I guess I what, what? What? Yeah. yeah, that team, Barrett, that team would be the best Detroit Lions team of all time. That 95 <laughs> team. It's true. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Mike, so you're – I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked Jeff McClain. The city is in, in rare form because they're actually confident. In fact, overly confident. You know how it is. It's usually gloom and doom. Worst case, you're you're digging through, you're excavating to find bad things. All right, they're not doing that this time around. How do you explain that? Oh, and that was the nasty drop there. Uh, how do yeah. you explain that? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, this is Andy Reid. This is Patrick Mahomes. They're they, they're in the Super Bowl like every other year. This team. I, I think a few factors are at play, Rob. Number one, I think the obvious one is the Eagles were so good all year that it it did feel kind of like, okay, they're going to get to the Super Bowl, right? And they won the two playoff games so convincingly um, with with their starters in there. There was no kind of underdog component with the backup quarterback and, you know, a slew of injuries, things like that. So that's one thing. The other factor, another factor is they won five years ago. It's not like the the city's been waiting and waiting and waiting 50 some years for the Eagles to win a Super Bowl. Um, They just experienced that joy a few years ago. And here's the other factor that I don't feel like enough people are talking about. I think there would be a lot more anxiety in Philadelphia if Andy Reid hadn't already won one Super Bowl. Mm. Because people would be saying to themselves, oh my gosh, the coach who was here 14 years and couldn't win one with us is going to beat us in this big game. I think the fact that Andy's already got one under his belt, it becomes a thing that like not as people aren't paying as close attention to and aren't as worked up about. Mm. Well, hey, give me one player right now on the defensive side of the ball will be pivotal uh, in 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 a Eagles win. That's a great question. I think it's it, it's whatever three headed defensive back linebacker monster um, is is sticking with Travis Kelsey, right? right. Like Kelsey's, you've got to try to limit him as much as you can. Um, you've got to keep him from really damaging you. You know. He had, what, I think nine or ten catches in that Super Bowl loss a couple of years ago. Yep. Um, but, but none of them really did all that much damage, and, and the Buccaneers did such a good job of harassing and pressuring Mahomes. Because White that, played a – Yeah, so, great. yeah, White, White's going to be part of that, but I don't think it's just going to be one guy on Travis Kelsey. Um, and I don't think it's going to be one guy – DJ. Yeah, it's, if you want to talk to one, about one person as opposed to one player, it's going to be Jonathan Gannon, I would say. All right. Well, I love it, man. I mean, I just think just, just my own insight, Kazir White and CJ Garner Johnson, bracket covers them. Let's hope that's the case right there. That'd be the best opportunity. I'm not sure I'd love Travis Kelsey against uh, Kazir White if I'm the Eagles, but, you know, we'll see what they do. How about Hurts? Um, you know, didn't light the world on fire, didn't have to in their in the, the playoff games. They ran the ball 44 times each game. That's going to take away from some of his numbers, that's for sure. But – couple opportunities missed maybe with some deep shots uh two weeks to let the shoulder heal he's as cool as a cucumber mike uh how do you think he plays in this game i think he plays for lack of a better way of putting it rob like all out i think and what i mean by that is not that he's going to try his hardest of course he's going to try his hardest but i think the idea that they're going to shack be he's going to be shackled or you know we saw a couple instances in the playoff games where he might have run out of bounds as opposed to turning the ball upfield on a carry. Uh, I think that goes out the window in this game. It has to. It's, it's for all the marbles. Um, and I'm curious to see how he fares early on because Lord knows the Eagles want to throw the ball early to get the lead. doesn't change. You know, that, that dynamic doesn't change even with Jalen Hurts in his shoulder. Uh, and especially after two weeks of it being allowed to heal. So 
I think the early the early uh, series in this game uh, will tell us a lot about Jalen Hurts and how he's going to perform. Mike, there's so many variables in this game because of that other team, Kansas City, that we talk about that we don't know what to expect. But as we sit here right now, if you're a betting man, do you do you anticipate the Eagles running or throwing the ball more? Probably running it. I think because it'll keep Kansas City off the field too, which you obviously want to do. And the Eagles um, can be explosive running the ball. You know, the NFL changed this season, Gunner. Look at the – the, the average yards per carry was higher than I think it's ever been in league history. More teams were running the ball for big plays uh, than in a long time, and the Eagles can do that. Uh, Hertz can do it. Miles Sanders can do it. Lately, Kenny Gainwell has been doing it. So I think you'll probably end up seeing them run the ball a little bit more. I think it'll be similar to what we've seen the last couple of weeks. Not that Hertz is only going to throw for like 150 yards, mm-hmm. but I think the Eagles are going to be able to – I don't think the issue in the game is the Eagles – ability to move the ball against the Kansas City defense. I think the question is, can Mahomes and the Chiefs outscore them? Yeah, yeah it's going to be fascinating. Do you, think great, Eagles, man, yeah. do you think Eagles win the game, Mike? I picked them 38-24 last, last week in my column. I just oh. I think they're the better team. I do. I think at some level, you know, Rob, you mentioned the, the uncomfortable position that everybody in Philadelphia is in by thinking the Eagles are going to win the Super Bowl. Right. They're the best team in the league, and sometimes I think it's just that simple. I think it'll be a fun game an exciting game, but I think they're going to win, and I think they're going to win by two touchdowns. All right, Mike, what's the next big story we can, uh, we can look for here? You know, Rob, it's funny. I just went out to uh, Tempe this morning at the Sun Devil Stadium. I'm doing a, a piece on the Eagles almost moved to Phoenix back in 1984, oh, and there, wow. was a, there was a mystery always associated with that story, uh, and I had solved the mystery. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to reveal any more because I want people to read it, but uh, yeah, so that's what's coming up next. Yeah, that was uh, awesome. yeah. Leonard Toast was in the throes of his uh, his his gambling debts, and he was uh, threatening to sell the team, and the league stepped in. All right, but that's yep. good, Mike. We're looking forward to it, man. We appreciate you giving us a couple minutes. All right, Any, you, anytime, guys. Enjoy uh, it. Great Mike, to see you. Take, take care, care man. Yep. All right, B, you got to hop off too for a minute here. Yeah, yeah, I got to go to Radio Row, fellas. Go do okay. your thing, man. Do All your right, thing, we'll, bro. We'll talk to you. All right, appreciate it, Barry. All right, and then there were two, Gunner. Me and you, baby. We're hanging. We're hanging, man. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. I, I, interesting insights. You know, we've had Jeff McClain on. We 